data um, you've given us and allowing the coronavirus to wake us up out of our slumber and busy schedules to rethink where we come from, where we headed, and reevaluate our time and place in Bible prophecy. We thank you and we ask that you bless this technology as we'll use it to try and communicate your truth. Help us to understand what happened with Sunday laws. And may your loving kindness bless us today. Protect us from any destruction from the enemy. And may you bless us today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Today we are talking about Sunday laws. In our previous uh, presentation that uh, Brother Christian referred to, we are talking about the counterfeit revival. And just as a brief revision, we saw that the end of time or last day events, Christ compares them to um, the childbirth pains that a woman in travail goes through. And we discovered that they come in various phases. You know, it's the same pain that repeats and increases in intensity and frequency as you get closer to labor. And it gets to a point where you can no longer endure, endure the pain. So you cannot bear it anymore. So you rush to the hospital and then you are relieved. Uh, so Christ compared his last day events to that. And we discovered that there is a counterfeit revival. Those are what starts everything, the natural disasters, and the, uh, which finally leads to this counterfeit revival. I'll put everything together on Sunday Laws 2. But on this class, I want us to understand the history of Sunday Laws, what they were in history and certain statements made by people about Sunday law becoming um, martial law. Things of that nature. So Can you go just a few paragraphs before I was here muting and muted myself, Luajo, so that muted for everyone, so I apologize. If you could just go a few words, just maybe uh, 15 seconds back. Okay. I've been burdened recently with uh, certain statements that people are making about Sunday laws. Uh, Sunday laws are going to come through martial law. You know, the United States president is just going to declare martial law and then Sunday laws. And other worrisome statements is that uh, through this state of emergency that global presidents are declaring that's how Sunday laws are, are going to come. So, and that's the purpose of this class is to basically understand what was the history of Sunday laws? How did the Sunday laws come? And, 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 and. So that's, that's why we want to study this. So. It's a very fascinating history that I would like your attention uh, to follow me very closely. So we're going now going to the first slide. Um, in the first slide, we have a quotation from last day events. And I want to encourage all of you, if you have the book, if you don't have it, please try to get a copy and read through that whole book. Uh, there's a section there about Sunday laws. And some of the statements I'm reading here are from that book. Others are not. But uh, with a historical background, I will give you, will be able to appreciate the statements better. Ellen White says, we have been looking for many years for a Sunday law to be enacted in our land. And now that the movement is right upon us, we ask, what are our people going to do in the matter? We should especially seek God for grace and power to be given his people now. God lives, and we do not believe that the time has fully come when he would have our liberties restricted. So Ellen White tells us that, uh, as we know, Seventh-day Adventists uh, using the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, we know Sunday laws are coming when we start Revelation chapter 13. But she's speaking about a Sunday law movement that is right upon us. And this is last day events. And this was in the 1800s, the 19th century when she said that. So it will become clearer as I discuss the Sunday law movement of the 18th century a little bit later. But uh, in the time of Ellen White, there was a strong movement for Sunday as a rest day. So that will become much more clear as our presentation continues. 
In the next slide, we have another statement. Uh, it's from Revere Harold Extra. And um, Ellen White says this, the Sunday movement is now making its way in darkness. The leaders are concealing the true issue and many who unite in the movement do not themselves see whither the undercurrent is tending. They are working in blindness. They do not see that if a Protestant government sacrifices the principles that have made them a free independent nation and through legislation brings into the papal falsehood and papal delusions, they are plunging into the Roman horrors of the Dark Ages. Taking home points or take home points here in this statement number one is that the Sunday movement in the time of Ellen White was concealing the true issue. They had a hidden agenda. Um, there is another Sunday seen in the newspapers. There's another also Sunday movement taking place in Europe. And um, they are really hiding behind many issues. Can you uh, repeat that, that last part, so Luajo? We didn't, it just uh, chopped a little bit. There's a Sunday movement. And can you repeat from there, please? There is a Sunday movement that is rising up in the United States um, that I'll talk about on Sunday Laws Part 2. There is also a Sunday uh, law movement that is uh, being developed in Europe through the European Sunday Alliance movement. And um, so those movements are very similar to the movements that happened in the 18th century during the time of Ellen White, rather the 19th century, excuse me for that. So that's why it's important for us to study history because history is repeating itself. It may not repeat itself exactly like it happened, but we are learning a lot from that. So, and then in the next slide, we want to look at how will the Sunday law be enacted according to Ellen White. So will it be a martial law? How will it come about? So I'm going to start there. This is how will it be enacted is the next slide, uh, which is a national act. Number one, our land is in jeopardy. She says the time is drawing on when we legislators shall so abjure the principles of Protestantism as to give countenance to Romish apostasy. The people for whom God has so marvelously wrought, strengthening them to throw them to throw off the galling yoke of popery, will by a national act give vigor to the corrupt faith of Rome, and thus arouse the tyranny which only awaits for a touch to start again into cruelty and despotism. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, page 410. We are learning that the Sunday law is going to come through a national act. A national act means that the citizens of the United States have to be the one requesting for Sunday law. It will not be coming top down. The nation of America are going to demand for a Sunday law before it comes. It's not going to be like Donald Trump will wake up one day and say, today, I'm going to declare Sunday law, and then it happens like that. From the pen of inspiration, we are not learning that. It says a national act. And what kind of act will this be? We are moving on to the next slide. It says it's going to be a law. It's a very important statement. Um, this is from Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 985. She says, a more decided effort will be made to exalt the false Sabbath and to cast contempt upon God himself by supplanting the day he has blessed and sanctified. This false Sabbath is to be enforced by an oppressive law. So when you're talking about a Sunday law, it will have to be a law. And what kind of law will it be? It will be an oppressive law. Then uh, Testimonies, Volume 5, page 451, she says, by the decree enforcing the institution of the papers in violation of the law of God, our nation will disconnect herself fully from righteousness. So it's going to be a national act, number one. Number two is going to be an oppressive law. Number three is going to be a decree. A martial law is still oppressive law. It can still be classified as a decree. Can it be a national act? Maybe not. Number four, which is found in the next slide. 
And this Sunday law, according to Ellen White, is going to come through an amendment to the Constitution. An amendment to the Constitution, which is very important. Uh, this is from Review Extra, December 18, 1888. She says, we see that efforts are being made to restrict our religious liberties. The Sunday question is now assuming large proportions. An amendment to our constitution is being urged in Congress. And when it is obtained, oppression must follow. A very important statement. That this law will come as a result of an amendment to the Constitution. The Constitution of the United States will be amended to allow for Sunday law to take place. And this may, amendment is going to take place at Congress level. So that's something that we see uh, very clear uh, in the pen of inspiration. Number five, about Sunday laws, is going to be a religious amendment to the Constitution. Um, this is from Review Extra, December 24, 1889. If the people can be led to favor a Sunday law, then the clergy intend to exert their united influence to obtain a religious amendment to the Constitution and compel the nation to keep Sunday. Key things to get out of this statement. Number one, the people can be led to favor a Sunday law. In other words, there's going to be a movement for Sunday law, a movement that promotes Sunday as a day of rest. Sometimes it can be called the day of family. And then the clergy or the ministers of other churches, the Sunday churches, are going to exert their influence to obtain a religious amendment into the Constitution. This is very important. And tying it with the previous class, we know, according to the Counterfeit Revival study, that this law is going to the threefold union influence. There's going to be apostate Protestantism, Catholicism, and spiritualism. All these three are going to exert their influence for a Sunday law in the United States. So the influence of apostate Protestantism will be that the Sunday churches are going to rise up a movement for Sunday um, law. And they are going to use this and then influence uh, the politicians uh, so that they can get a religious amendment to the Constitution. And that's how a Sunday law is going to take place. So review the five points again. It's going to be a national act. It's going to be a law. It's going to be a decree. It's going to be an amendment to the Constitution. It's going to be a religious amendment to the Constitution. So as I read these five key points about how Ellen White portrays how Sunday laws are going to come, I don't find any evidence for martial law as Sunday laws. I don't. Uh, maybe if somebody has statements that says martial law, and just to let you know, martial law existed in the time of Ellen White, and she was well aware of it. She could have used the word martial law for Sunday law, but we just want to stick clearly to written uh, inspired writings uh, on these particular issues. So in the next um, slide, where will the Sunday law start? Yes? Christian and Luahu. This is Heather Hilliard talking, and I'm an attorney, and I could probably give some, I don't know, some color to those statements that you just talked about. I don't know if you want to do that now, or do you want to wait to the end? Um, I would really appreciate your comment towards the end. Okay. Because I'm going to go through some history here, and also go through... Um, um, or maybe if you gave it now, it would have more weight, right? Because maybe the content I'm about to cover may help people forget and may lead you not to make your point. Yeah. Maybe let me, let me give you some time. Okay. Well, I'll be quick. Yeah. I think right. everything you said is correct. I just wanted to give you an understanding. I think either the Constitution has to be amended, um, either the Congress has to decide they want an amendment or what I can see happening is that Congress will try to pass a law or a government will try to do something and pass a law and then there will be opposition to it and then it'll probably be forced into the court system which would take it to the Supreme Court level and that's why in America we're so interested in who's on the Supreme Court because they're the ones that decide the law of the land. 
And I think they're right. the ones that could then order a constitutional amendment or the Congress could decide. And when he says the people, when she says the people, remember that the Congress and the House of Representatives, they're elected by the people. So that's the representative body that I can see making that choice. And as far as the National Act, so once you get the Constitution amended, then the federal government has the ability to create a national act based on that constitutional amendment. And then the states can cre create decrees or laws underneath it that are consistent with the national act. So it kind of, that's okay. kind of a top down approach to it. And so I think everything you're saying is plausible, but there's no set, there's not a difference between the word constitutional amendment or religious constitutional amendment. That's just, a different term for the same thing and then i i think a national act a law and decree those could be different levels within the government but they all would have the same force because the national okay. act is at the federal level so anyway well, thank you. just a little fyi mm -hmm. thank you so much for that so we move on to the next slide which is um it starts in america so Testimonies, volume six, page uh, 18, paragraph two, Ellen White says, as America, the land of religious liberty, shall unite with the papacy in forcing the conscience and compelling men to honor the false Sabbath, the people of every country on the globe will be led to follow her example. So from this statement, uh, key points, uh, America will join with the papacy um, in enacting a Sunday law and that every country will follow her example. So America is gonna be the one leading out. Uh, the next statement, Testimonies, Volume 6, page 395. Foreign nations will follow the example of the United States. Though she leads out, yet the same crisis will come upon our people in all parts of the world. So Testimonies, Volume 6, page 395. So she's very clear that America will be the one in the forefront of leading out on this uh, Sunday law uh, issue that we have. Then from America, it's gonna move to Christian nations, which is found in the next slide. The whole Christian world will be involved. The whole Christian world will be involved. In last day events, page 137, she says, in the great conflict between faith and unbelief, the whole Christian world will be involved. So, so you have it, beginning in America, and then she mentions the Christian world following later. Um, all Christendom were enacted, and the attention of the entire world will be upon it. In the issue of the contest, all Christendom will be divided into two great classes, those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, and those who worship the beast in his image and receive his mark. Although church and state will unite their power to compel all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and born, Revelation 13, 16, to receive the mark of the beast, yet the people of God will not receive it. Great controversy, page 450. Um, so we are learning from there that uh, Christendom will act it, will enact it, sorry. Um, so you have that beginning in America, then Christian nations, and then to every nation. You know, there are non-Christian nations like China, North Korea, and uh, others, which will come a little bit later. And uh, if you really did uh, read some of the other slides that I didn't actually read in the counterfeit revival, we understand that um, Ellen White tells us that heathen deities are going to appear, heathen gods. I mean, you can imagine if Muhammad was going to appear to the Muslims and uh, Buddha or, uh, you know, appears to his followers and, you know, the gods of the Hindu religion appears to them and they tell them to go to church on Sunday. Um, that would easily influence uh, those non-Christian nations to follow that. But we'll look at that uh, when we look at uh, Sunday Laws Part 2. I was just hinting to that so that we could see how, uh, how that could work out. Then to every nation, this is the next slide, if you have not turned there. It will go to all the world. The decree enforcing the worship of this day is to go forth to all the world. Um, so it's going to be global. Number two, all the world will act a part. 
The Sabbath question is to be the issue in the great final conflict in which all the world will act a part. So, Testimonies, Volume 6, page 352. Um, so, number three, foreign nations will accept it. Foreign nations will follow the example of the United States. Though she leads out, yet the same crisis will come upon our people in all parts of the world. Testimonies, Volume 6, page 395. So, um, so that is, in a nutshell, what Ellen White says about Sunday law. Just an overview, uh, how it's going to be enacted in America, and uh, that America is going to lead out, and then the other nations follow. Now, the next section of the presentation, I'm going to switch sides um, and um, move on to the first Sunday law that was enacted by Constantine in 321 AD. And I'm going to trace that Sunday law from 321 AD up to 538. And we are going to see the development of that Sunday law until it was an oppressive law. So that's what I'm going to transition. The Sunday movement of the fourth century. That's what we want to transition to now. So we are moving on to the next slide, which is the first Sunday law, uh, AD 321. This Sunday law was enacted by Emperor Constantine and um, it says, all judges and city people and the craftsmen shall rest upon the venerable day of the sun. Country people, however, may freely attend to the cultivation of the fields because it frequently happens that no other day are better adapted for planting the grain in the furrows or the vines in the trenches so that the advantage given by the heavenly providence may not for the occasion of a short time perish. So when you notice something that you notice about this Sunday law is that it's just a rest law. It just says people who are working in the city should rest on the day on, on Sunday, the venerable day of the sun. And if you are staying out in the country, you are free to work in the field. And it says nothing about going to church on Sunday or worshiping on Sunday. That's how the first Sunday law was uh, enacted. It had nothing to do with worshiping on Sunday. Uh, but from the pen of inspiration, we understand that uh, Ellen White tells us that Constantine was yielding to the bishops in Rome uh, who wanted a Sunday law. And uh, so it was still, it still had a religious motive, but the wording had nothing to do with religion, as you see there. And um, so that it, the evidence can be clear that this Sunday law was given um, in a book written by A.T. Jones, one of our pioneers, he has written quite a lot on Sunday laws in the 18th century, 18th, 19th century, and also in the 4th century, so I'll be quoting from his uh, books a lot. Um, Sunday legislation, page 4, A.T. Jones, the purpose of the first Sunday law. This is the next slide, I think, yeah. There should be a suspension of business at the courts and in other civil offices so that the day might be devoted with less interruption to the purposes of devotion. So the people wanted, they did not want to be disturbed of their worship on Sunday. So that's why the law was given, so that people who want to worship on Sunday should not be disturbed at all. And this disturbance doesn't make sense to you now, but it'll soon make sense um, as we read uh, more of what happened really in history. And AD 386, which is the next slide, um, Neander's church history, Neander's church history, page 300, he says, those older changes effected by Emperor Constantine were more rigorously enforced. And in general, civil transactions of every kind on Sunday were strictly forbidden. Whoever transgressed was to be considered, in fact, as guilty of sacrilege. So the, the changes by, by Constantine were more rigorously enforced. It seems like the law was strengthened here in 8386 to forbid uh, civil transactions of any kind on Sunday. I mean, um, this is where you have businesses shut down on Sunday. There's no one who does much work on Sunday and uh, things like that. So it was serious. And uh, what happened? In another book uh, by Alonzo T. Jones, A.T. Jones, The Rights of the People. It's another book I really recommend for you to read. It does a very good job of Sunday laws. 
page 219. He says, then as the people were not allowed to do any man of work, they would play, <coughs> excuse me, and as the natural consequence, the circuses and the theaters throughout the empire were crowded every Sunday. But the object of the law from the first one that was issued was that the day might be used for the purposes of devotion and the people might go to church. Consequently, that this object might be met, there was another step to take, and it was taken. At a church convention held at Carthage in 401, the bishops passed a resolution to set up a petition to the emperor. Um, and um, key points to take out of this is that uh, since the Sunday law said civil transactions of every kind were forbidden by 386, People were not now allowed to work. So they started becoming idle on Sundays. So they started congregating in circuses and they were going to the theaters to entertain themselves. So this did not sit well with the bishops. Uh, the bishops were not happy with this. So they called a convention, at the city of Carthage, it's called the Carthage Convention in 401. And uh, this is the resolution they came up with. In the next slide, we see the resolution. And um, this is um, number one, resolution number one, that the public shows might be transferred from the Christian Sunday and from fifth days to some other days of the week. So this is also Neander's church history. So it's basically saying that uh, the petition that the bishops had was, we want to move the Sunday entertainment to be moved from Sunday to any other day of the week. And uh, the reason that was given for that petition was that the people congregated more to the circuses than to the church. <laughs> so they were saying, well, people are going to the theaters. They're going to the circuses more than coming to church. So the theaters and the circuses are becoming the competitor of the church. So we cannot have competition. The church wanted a monopoly. And that's why A.T. Jones says this very interesting statement. Uh, Rights of the People, page 219, he says, in the circuses and the theaters, large numbers of men were employed, among whom were many were church members. But rather than give up their jobs, they would work on Sunday. The bishops complained that these were compelled to work. They pronounced it persecution and asked for a law to protect those, um, those persons from such persecution, in quotes. The church had become filled with a mass of people, unconverted, who cared vastly more for worldly interests and pleasures than they did for religion. And as the government was now a government of God, it was considered proper that civil power should be used to call all to show respect for God, whether or not they had any respect for him. Very interesting. You know, it's like uh, people saying, well, we need to close businesses on Sabbath because church members are going to work on Saturday instead of coming to church. What's the problem? Is it the businesses or the church members? <laughs> it's very clear that the problem is with the church members. They are dead spiritually. So in the fourth century, they said, no, the problem is the circuses. The problem is the theaters. So um, for one, uh, they had that. And uh, this petition of the Carthage Convention, I'm now moving on to the next slide, AD 425, would not be granted at once. But in 425, the desired law was secured. And to this also, there was attached the reason that was given for the first Sunday law that was ever made, namely, in order that the devotion of the faithful might be free from all disturbance. Neander's Church History, page 301 as quoted in Rights of the People, A.T. Jones, page 221. So 425, uh, petition, um, the Carthage Convention petition was granted, and now the law forbade, closed the circuses, closed the theaters, so that the people can have time to go to church. And what happened? Do you think they went to church? No, they didn't go to church. They sat at home, and they were idle. So what would they do? Rights of the People, A.T. Jones, 221. First, the church had all work on Sunday forbidden in order that the people might attend to things divine. But the people went to the circus system, to the theaters instead of to the church. Then the church had laws enacting. Did I tell you that I'm moving on to the next slide? We, we are there. We're following Luaho. Yeah, you didn't tell us, but, but Sarah, okay. Sarah is following good. All right, all right. 
Let me start that from uh, beginning. First, the church had all work on Sunday forbidden in order that the people might attend to things divine. But the people went to the circuses and to the theaters instead of to the church. Then the church had the laws enacted, closing the circuses and the theaters in order that the people might attend to things divine. But even then, the people would not be devoted, nor attend to things divine, for they had no real religion. The next step was then to be taken. Therefore, in the logic of the situation, was to compel them to be devoted, to compel them to attend to things divine. So this was the next step logically to be taken, and it was taken. Uh, so, you know, the people are now seated at home, and they need to go to church, but they're not going to church, so what do we do? Then uh, something else happened next. The theocritical bishops were equal to the occasion. They were ready with a theory that exactly met the demands of the case. And the great Catholic church father and Catholic saints, and Augustine was the father of this Catholic saintly theory, he wrote, they started UC Augustine's theory of persecution here. Um, in the next slide, it says, it is better that man should be brought to serve God by instruction than by fear of punishment or by pain. But because the former means are better, the latter must not therefore be neglected. Many must often be brought back to their Lord like wicked servants by the rod of temporal suffering because they attain to the highest grade of religious development. This is Philip Schaff's Church History, Volume 2, Section 27. So they started using Constantine's uh, theory of persecution. Constantine used the parable of Christ uh, that's found in Luke chapter 14 that says, compel them to come in. And he basically argued that God has given the church two swords, the sword of the spirit, which is the Bible, and the sword of steel, which is persecution. Um, so that uh, it's better if people are led to the church by the sword of the spirit, the Bible. But if the sword of the spirit does not succeed, we are going to uh, beat them into the kingdom of God. So that theory of persecution that was clearly crafted by uh, um, Augustine was now employed. And uh, Church History of Neander, page 217, he says, it was by Augustine then that a theory was proposed and founded which contained the gem of that whole system of spiritual despotism, of intolerance and persecution, which ended in the tribunals of the Inquisition. So now God's people started going through serious persecution after 425. But the persecution was limited because the Catholic Church did not have political power, um, especially in Western Rome, until 538. So what we have been covering is summarized in the next slide. So we are discovering that um, the Sunday law in the fourth century, it had basically four stages. In AD 321, you have the Sunday rest law or the Sunday closing law uh, that basically said um, uh, people in the cities should not work, those in the country could work. And then in 386, you have the second stage, which is on a Sunday, where all civil transactions were forbidden. Um, and uh, you had to treat Sunday with reverence. Uh, the theaters were shut down and people still didn't go to church on Sunday. So, and then 425, the Carthage Convention was uh, granted. And uh, the law that says worship on Sunday or else we are going to lead you into the kingdom of God by persecution. On Sunday, you must go to church. Um, so 425, and then 538, when the papacy gained political power from Emperor Justinian, um, there was serious persecution that came on um, Sabbatarian Christians, or Christians who kept the Sabbath. So that is how the Sunday movement was in the 4th century. It's very interesting when you compare this with what happened in the 18th century. Um, we are transitioning now to the Sunday law movement of the 18th century, uh, which is in the next slide. The 18th century Sunday movement was very interesting. Um, November 8, 1887, there was a held a Sunday law convention. And I'm not American. Some of those towns are a bit challenging for me to pronounce. How do you pronounce that? Ilgin, Illinois. If somebody can unmute an American, 
and tell us Elgin. <laughs> what is it, Joe? Elgin, I think. Elgin, they think. Okay. Elgin, Illinois. November 8, 1887. Mark this date. November 8, 1887. There was held the Sunday Law Convention. This was co convention was called by the members of the Elgin Association of Congregational Ministers and Churches. So you have this group of Sunday ministers who had come together in some kind of ecumenism. Um, and what were they there for? To consider the prevalent desecration of the Sabbath and its remedy. It was well attended by prominent ministers. Uh, in that convention, the following resolutions were passed. Uh, so there were basically four resolutions that were passed. The first one, that we recognize the Sabbath as an institution of God revealed in nature and the Bible and of perpetual obligation on all men and also as a civil and American institution huh. bound up in vital and historical connection with the origin and foundation of our government, the growth of our polity, and necessary to be maintained in order for the preservation and integrity of our national system and therefore as having a sacred claim on all patriotic american citizens so they basically argued that the sabbath is an institution of god and is tied with the history of the united states it's part of the u.s government kind of very interesting the second resolution found in the next slide resolved that we look what shame and sorrow on the non-observance of the sabbath by many christian people in that the custom prevails with them of purchasing sabbath newspapers engaging in and patronizing sabbath business and travel and in many instances giving themselves to pleasure and self-indulgence setting aside by neglect and indifference the great duties and privileges which god's day brings them so they were lamenting what they called the Sabbath desecration, which they meant was Sunday desecration. Um, and then the third resolution that we give our votes and support to those candidates or political officers who will pledge themselves to vote for the enactment and enforcing of statutes in favor of the civil Sabbath. So their resolution number three, which is the key one I wanted to emphasize, was that they wanted to support political candidates um, who are going to promote the enactment and enforcing of stand, statutes in favor of the civil Sabbath. So after the Sunday law movement, uh, things started transitioning and changing. There were other movements and conventions that started being held in other places. And if you move on to the next slide, in another Elgin convention, Dr. Everts said, the Sunday train is another great evil. Oh, okay. What's evil about the Sunday train? They cannot afford to run a train unless they get a great many passengers and so break up a great many congregations. The Sunday railroad trains are hurrying their passengers fast onto petition. What an outrage that the railroad, that great civilizer, should destroy the Christian Sabbath. So what are they saying? that when the train runs on Sunday, it's breaking the Sabbath because people are boarding the train on Sunday. And uh, the train is breaking up many churches. Is the problem the train or the church members? Obviously, the problem is the church members. And then you have Reverend W.F. Crafts speaking before the United States Senate Committee in April 1888 in favor of the National Sunday Law said, the law allows the local postmaster, if he chooses, and some of them do choose, to open the mails at every hour of the church and so make the post office the competitor of the churches. Remember that in the fourth century, they were saying the theaters and the circuses are breaking up our churches. They are competing with the churches. So let's close the theaters. Let's close the, the, the circuses and therefore provide an opportunity for people to go to church. It's the same thing people said in the 18th century. They were saying the postman, the train, all of this are taking a lot of our congregants. So we need to close them. Very interesting. And in the next slide, uh, Dr. McLister uh, works at Lakeside, Ohio, July 1887. 
um, he said something very interesting. He says, let a man be what he may, a Jew, seventh-day observer of some other denomination, or those who do not believe in the Christian Sabbath, let the law apply to everyone that there shall be no public desecration of the first day of the week, the Christian Sabbath, the day of rest for the nation. They may hold any other day of the week as sacred and observe it, but that day, which is one day in seven for the nation at large, let not that be publicly desecrated by anyone, by office and the government, or by private citizen, high or law, rich or poor. So it's basically saying the law is going to apply to everyone, whether you are a Sabbath observer or a Jew. So that was their intention. This was July 1887. Then there was a woman Christian Temperance Union, uh, which is found in the next slide. And uh, this movement, um, let's hear from the president's annual address in a convention in Nashville. In 1887, this is what he said about the Women Christian Temperance Union. Ellen White in her writings talks about this uh, Women Christian Temperance Union and what they wanted to bring. Um, and what was their main aim? Let me read to you a statement from their president. Uh, the Women Christian Temperance Union, local, state, national, and worldwide, has one vital organic thought, one all absorbing purpose, one undying enthusiasm. And that is that Christ shall be this world's king. Yea, verily, this world's king in his realm, of course, and effect. King of his courts, of its camps, of its commons, king of its colleges and cloisters, king of its customs and its constitutions. The kingdom of Christ must enter the realm of law through the gateway of politics. We pray heaven to give them the old parties no rest until they shall swear an oath of allegiance to Christ in polities, and march in one great army up to the poles to worship God. So is a, the main aim of the Women Christian Temperance Union was to make sure that Sunday is respected and that everybody recognizes God. So they were pushing for a theocracy in the United States in the 18th century. And thank God it didn't go through. And um, one thing that is very interesting is their admission. Uh, when they were asked the question about persecution, uh, when this Sunday law has been passed, will, will that not be persecution to other people who believe differently? So let's uh, hear what they responded in the next slide. At the National Reform, WCTU convention held at Lakeside, Ohio in 1887, the following question was asked. Will not the national reform movement result in persecution against those who, on some points, believe differently from the majority, even at the recognition of the Christian religion by the Roman power, resulted in grievous persecution against the true Christians? Their question was very simple. Will this law or this movement not lead to Christian persecution, like the papers you did in the Dark Ages? And what is their response? The answer by Dr. McLister is... Now, notice the fallacy here. The recognition of the Roman Catholic religion by the state made that state a persecuting power. Why? Because the Roman Catholic religion is a persecuting religion. If true Christianity is a persecuting religion, then the acknowledgement of our principles by the state will make the state a persecutor. But if the true Christian religion is a religion of liberty, a religion that regards the rights of all, um, then the acknowledgement of those principles by the state will make the state the guardian of all men, and the state will be no respecter. True religion never persecutes. This is from Rights of the People, page 232. That's very interesting. It's basically saying uh, you cannot compare us with Catholicism because the Roman Catholic Church is a persecuting church. It is a persecuting religion. And we are Protestants, we are not persecuting. Even if you gave us political power, we'll not persecute. But wait a moment. Let's move on to the next slide and ask the Catholics if they think they are a persecuting religion. That's very interesting to read this history. Um, in the next slide, AD 556, Pope Pelagius called upon Nazis to compel certain parties to obey the Pope's command. Nazis refused on the ground that it would be persecution. 
Then the Pope answered Narcissus' objection with his argument. So let's ask the Pope, has the church ever persecuted anyone? Baba's history of the Pope, Pelagius 85 F6, it says, Be not alarmed at the idle talk of some crying out against persecution and reproaching the church as if she delighted in cruelty. When she punishes evil with wholesome severities or procures the salvation of souls, he alone persecutes who forces to evil. But to restrain men from doing evil or to punish those who have done it is not persecution or cruelty, but love of mankind. <laughs> so here the Pope says the church is not really persecuting because you only persecute when you force people to do evil. But you love them, even if you, bar you burn a Protestant to death. It's love. You are just punishing evil with wholesome severities. And that's how you are compelling them into the kingdom by the sort of temporal punishment. So that's what happened. So this Sunday law movement ended up leading to um, something very, very interesting that we find in the next slide, where there was a senator, Senator Blair, um, in 1888, who wanted an amendment to the Constitution to be made. And he introduced a bill in the 50th Congress, the first session, S-2983. And uh, I just want to read um, this bill so that it can give you an idea, because Ellen White commented uh, around this time uh, when she was talking about the Sunday law movement is now making its way in darkness, and uh, she's now she said they are seeking a, relig uh, a religious amendment to the constitution, and when it is gained, uh, persecution will result. Some of the statements we read earlier, um, these statements were made in reference to these acts. Uh, this one, May 21, 1888. There was another attempt in 1889 uh, uh, by Senator Blair again. He tried in 1888 and uh, to get this bill to go through, but it died um, right there in the Committee on Education and Labor. And then he res resuscitated it again the next year, which was 1889, and it also did not make it. So let's read the 50th Congress, first session, as 2983. In the Senate of the United States, May 21, 1888, Mr. Blair introduced the following bill, which was read twice and referred to the Committee on Education and Labor. A bill to secure to the people the enjoyment of the first day of the week, commonly known as the Lord's Day, as a day of rest, and to promote its observance as a day of religious worship. This is how the bill started. Be it enacted in the next slide. Be it enacted by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled that no person or corporation or agent, servant or employee of any person or corporation shall perform or authorize to be performed any secular work, labor or business to the disturbance of others. Works of necessity, mercy and humanity exempted. Nor shall any person engage in any play, game, or amusement or recreation to the disturbance of others on the first day of the week, commonly known as the Lord's Day. Or, or during any part there are, in any territory, district, vessel, or place subject to the exclusion jurisdiction of the United States. Nor shall it be lawful for any person or corporation to receive pay for labor or service performed or rendered in violation of this section. Just a brief comment that uh, if you compare at this uh, proposed bill by Senator Blair with um, the Sunday law movement of the fourth century, you'll see very striking similarities. You know, that uh, they were saying the businesses are disturbing the devotion of Sunday worshippers. Here, the law has that, you know, insinuation to the disturbance of others. And um, it doesn't stop here. There's about six sections. I will not read all of it, but I just want to highlight section two and section three. In the next slide, it says that no males or male matter shall hereafter be transported in time of peace over any land postal route, nor shall any male matter be collected, assorted, handled, or delivered during any part of the first day of the week, provided 
that whenever any letter shall relate to a work of necessity or mercy, or shall concern the health, life, or disease of any person, and the fact shall be plainly stated upon the face of the envelope containing the same. The Postmaster General shall provide for the transportation, transportation of such letters. Excuse me. So you see, in the Sunday law movement of the 18th century, they were saying the postman is competing with the church because he opens his post on Sunday. So they made sure that they made that section two that forbade the postman from doing that. And then section three deals with businesses, that the persecution of commerce between the states and the Indian tribes, the same not being works of necessity, mercy, or humanity, by the transportation of persons or property by land or water, in such a way as to interfere with or disturb the people in the enjoyment of the festival of the week, or any portion thereof as a day of rest from labor, the same not being labor of necessity, mercy, or humanity, or its observance as a day of religious worship, is hereby prohibited. And any person or corporation or agent or employee or any person or corporation who shall willfully violate this section shall be punished by a fine of not less than 10 or more than $1,000. And no service performed in the prosecution of such prohibited comments shall be lawful, nor shall any compensation be recoverable or be paid for the same. So there are many sections. If you're interested, I can send you the whole bill, the 50th uh, one and the 51st uh, bill. So this was the Sunday law. Um, as you see here in this Sunday bill, Senator Blair bill, it doesn't say anything about going to church on Sunday. It just basically says stop working on Sunday, really. You know, stop businesses on Sunday, stop transportation of goods on Sunday, stop going to the mail on Sunday, so that you don't disturb those who want to worship. So, and uh, it's very, very similar in a way to the first Sunday law of Constantine, although it has elements of 8386 of restricting, you know, entertainment and things like that to it. So this is more of like a Congress Sunday rest law, kind of. It doesn't have anything to do with worship. So that leads us to a transition to the next part of this presentation. And before I go, I'm not sure whether there are any questions or points of clarification before we transition to the next one. Everybody's muted, but if you have any question, you can unmute yourself and, and uh, throw your question. But if not, we, we continue. Yeah, I hope everybody's still alive and up. Everybody's still alive, muted, listening attentively, giving me thumbs up, uh, but, right. uh, but they're listening. So, so yeah, we can continue. Um, All just, right. Just give us a moment to put back the slide. There was a, a snapping there of the slide. It happened to me yesterday, so. Okay, no problem. Do deep breathing, people, if you need to, to digest their next part. Are we waiting? <laughs> All right. Just I'll, I'll let you know, Loaho, when we have the the presentation All right. up for um, to continue. That's good. Okay, we're ready. It's up already. All right. So please turn to the slide that is a title Sunday Stages. Yes, we're there. Okay. So from history in the fourth century, uh, we learned that there were four faces to the Sunday law. There was closed business on Sunday. There was Reverend Sunday and then Worship Sunday, and then there was that, the death decree. In the 18th century, we saw that there was a Sunday law movement that finally led to uh, Sunday as a day of rest so that you don't disturb people that want to go to church on Sunday. So like a Sunday uh, business closing law, kind of, at Congress level. So not only are we using this history to conclude that uh, Sunday law is going to have four stages. There are statements of Ellen White that do actually confirm that. And we want to go through the statements and also through some uh, Bible verses um, so that we can see these things uh, much more clearly. So the point we're making is that Sunday law is not going to just come out and just say, worship on Sunday the next day. It, it's going to take time to build up until it gets to worship on Sunday, until Sunday law becomes the mark of the beast. So that's very important to understand. 
Um, so the first Sunday law, the first stage is closing businesses on Sunday or Sunday as a day of rest. Um, if you have your Bibles, I don't know how long this is going to take us. We'll probably not finish the rest of the slides in this time because I'm interested in giving you time to engage. Uh, but uh, I will cover the first two stages and then probably stage three and four will finish up in the next Sunday Laws part two with other details that will come with that. So can we please turn our Bibles to Revelation chapter 13? Revelation chapter 13 we know has uh, two beasts and um, I'm assuming that you are all familiar with Revelation 13 prophecy. The first beast is the paper C and the second beast the United States of America and we are moving to verse uh, 13 and 14. Revelation 13 verse 13 and 14. The Bible says, and he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men. And it deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. Let's just stop there for a moment. This is Protestantism in the United States that is doing great wonders and miracles causing fire to come down from heaven. And what is the purpose of these miracles? It is to deceive those that dwell on the earth. What is the object of deceiving them? According to the Bible, uh, the purpose of these miracles is to lead the people to make something what the Bible calls the image of the beast, the image to the beast. Uh, what is the beast? The beast is the papacy. What is the image to the beast? Um, I was just going to simplify this because I don't have time to give you... Uh, detailed study on this. Um, the image, your image is something that looks exactly like you. So uh, what is the beast? The beast is the papacy. And what is portrayed about the papacy in Revelation chapter 13, verse 1 to 10? Number one, the papacy is a result of a unity of church and state. And then after that, the papacy is worshipped. And the papacy persecutes and the papacy uh, does uh, makes war against God's people and it's finally able to have worldwide influence. That's what we see about the papacy. So an image of the papacy should behave in a similar manner like the papacy. So the image we're expecting it to also be a result of unity of church and state. And what brought about unity of church and state in the papacy? It was through Sunday laws that church and state were united. Um, and also when the papacy was given political power by Emperor Justinian. So the image of the beast is basically when America duplicates what the papacy did during the Dark Ages, when there's unity of church and state, and then there's worship, and then there's uh, persecution of God's people, and uh, that is globally enforced. So... This miracles, according to the Bible, is going to lead to the formation of the image to the beast. And one thing that I want you to notice that's very interesting here is verse 15. It says, 13 verse 15, he had power to give life to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that, that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So there are four stages to this image of the beast. The first stage is they make an image to the beast. The second stage they give life to the image of the beast. The third stage, the image of the beast starts speaking, causing everybody to worship the, the image of the beast. And then the first phase is the image of the beast causes people who do not worship to be killed. So there are four, four phases of the image to the beast. And um, so I have seen a parallel between the stages with Sunday laws. Uh, and I parallel making an image the beast with closing businesses on Sunday. Um, so I can give you a detailed study of how I do that, but for the purpose of this study, I just wanted to do that introduction. Uh, so Sunday during this time is not a test. It's not a test. Um, I'll read this very interesting article 
uh, that I'd sent as a reading assignment uh, for some of you to read. I don't know how many people were able to read that, but if you haven't, you still have time to read it before Sunday Law uh, Part 2. Rivian Herald, April 6, 1911. She says, this is in the next slide. If they do this, there is danger that as soon as the opposing element can get the slightest opportunity, they will stir up one another to persecute those whom they hate. At present, Sunday keeping is not the test. The time will come when men will not only forbid Sunday work, but they will try to force men to labor on the Sabbath and to subscribe to Sunday observance or forfeit their freedom and their lives. But the time for this has not yet come, and for the truth must be presented more fully before the people as a witness. Background, um, during the time of Ellen White, um, there's something that we call Sunday blue laws in various states in the United States. And some of these blue laws were enacted, I mean, were rather enforced. Um, and some of the people who stayed in Tennessee and other southern states were faced with persecution. And Ellen White was asked the question that, um, should these people labor on Sunday or not? And she gave this counsel that, you know what, the time will come when men will not only forbid Sunday work. So she's basically saying, uh, this Sunday rest law here is not like the it's not the same as the Sunday law that says don't worship on worship on Sunday. It's different. So during this stage, um, you are free to still worship on Sabbath, but um, you can do some other work that I will explain when I get to stage two. Um, and it's important to mention here that there are other countries in, in the world. Um, when I was um, in Europe, in certain parts of Europe, um, Europe is reaching the first stage of the Sunday law in certain states. Certain states forbid Sunday shopping uh, in Europe. I know certain states in Germany. I know certain states also in uh, certain parts of Austria also. Uh, Sundays, there are certain shopping malls that are closed and uh, in Italy, in Spain, um, and you can actually go to European Sunday Alliance and get the countries where uh, uh, Sunday closing law is seriously being considered it, and also European Parliament. Is yes. that is that a website, Luaho, European Sunday Alli Alliance? Yes, the European Sunday Alliance dot EU. You can go there. I'll, I'll, I will talk about it more when I deal with Sunday Law Stage uh, Part 2. This is just to give you an idea. So this council is still applicable to people in those territories that if the law says you should rest on Sunday, obey the law. Rest on Sunday. Because that's very, very important. And um, I will explain this when I deal with Part 2 of, uh, I mean, it's, it's Stage 2 of Sunday Laws. Um, and then the next slide, uh, this is where it's important that we understand where we are going with this. Um, Sunday law decree assigned to live the large cities. Testimonies, volume 5, page 464. I'm going to talk about country living and living the cities in the Sunday law part 2 in detail. I just wanted to highlight here that um, um, if you are in the United States and you are living in the cities, Ellen White has long written that we should try by all means to move out of the cities. And this is not like a fanatical moving out of the cities, jumping out of these big cities and running somewhere where you don't know where you're going. She's talking about it, let it be done, not impulsively. Don't take a step that you'll regret. It should be carefully done and it should be according to God's providence. Um, so this is one of the major signs for those whom the Lord will still have allowed to leave, to be in the cities, to leave once the Sunday Lord decree is at this stage, in the first stage. She says, it is no time now for God's people to be fixing their affections or laying up their treasures in the world. The time is not far distant when, like the early disciples, we shall be forced to seek refuge in desolate and solitary places. As the siege of Jerusalem by the Roman armies was the signal for flight to the Judean Christians, so the assumption of power on the part of our nation in, a de in the decree enforcing the papal Sabbath will be a warning to us 
it will then be time to leave the large cities preparatory to leaving the smaller ones for retired homes in secluded places among the mountains. This is a very interesting statement because it's found in Testimonies, Volume 5, page 464 to 465. Testimonies, Volume 5, this section of Testimonies to the Church was puzzles that Ellen White wrote when the Sunday law issue was being agitated in the United States. It was during the time when Senator Blair was, uh, the bill of Senator Blair was still being discussed, and it was during that time that she made this very clear that uh, once this bill goes through, if this bill goes through, then it's a warning that we need to leave the large cities and go to the smaller ones for those who may still be in the cities. So and then we transition to the second stage. Luaho, so, uh, I yes. don't know if you'll cover, I'll just throw the question, but I don't know if you'll uh, cover it in this one or on Saturday on part two. Uh, I bet the okay. question, you mentioned something that God already said it was far time for those, uh, basically the ideal to be living in the country, but that needs to be done with prayer and not impulsively and God leading. Uh, then then this, this quote, uh, will you explain sometime a little more? Because for what I understand, there's the first stages of Sunday law where will be the time for giving the loud cry and preaching. So we don't want to be hiding in desolate places. What is the stage from those stages where it's really, you know, the work has been done and the preaching has been done and it's time to basically go to desolate places to, to seek uh, refuge? Just throwing the question, I don't know when you will cover it. It doesn't need to be now if you'll cover it later. And, and also the part of, of, yeah, basically like I see stages also of country living, the ideal for God's people to be there already for better communion with him. And then kind of a time to flee that, that part practically, how, how do the council? Yes, yes. Uh, um, I, I, those are very important questions, uh, Christian. And um, I will, I'm going to deal with them. I have a presentation that is very long on country living, but I'll try to make it very concise and practical. And I, I do recommend for other people who are interested to, who are on Facebook to go to our Pure Light Missions uh, Facebook page. Um, I just recently completed a six part series on last day events and this country living and end times where I deal with this issue step by step. It's a 30 minute presentation I did there and others that had to deal with property and investment and end times that I may not have time to deal with in this class. Uh, I'm going to give you as much as I can, but we're limited with time. So I have this presentation is done on various aspects of end time practical preparation. But I will deal with country living um, in, in a practical manner. And you will see how everything is going to fit in also with the loud cry issue that you, you spoke about. Um, where is the loud cry? And um, just one one line statement, Ellen White makes it clear that the loud cry will be mostly through our literature. Yes, we'll be preaching. I'm not saying we'll not be preaching, but our pen and voice, our pen will do a greater work. And also our voices are also going to do a greater work uh, through the loud cry. But that will be clear. We have a class on loud cry and everything's going to gel. So I just used the Sunday law as a foundation for that. So, and then um, in the second stage, it says Sunday laws as um, on a Sunday or treat Sunday with reference, respect. We saw in the fourth century on a Sunday meant don't go to theaters, don't go to the circuses, stay at home. And um, so you need to treat Sunday with reverence. So I parallel that with giving life to the image of the beast. Now the image of the beast has been given life. And uh, it was during this time um, where Ellen White gave several counsels, as you see there, uh, in Testimonies, Volume 9, page 232 to 235. Um, the title is Sunday Labor. This is the counsels of Ellen White that she gave about activities to be done during Sunday in this stage of the law. Uh, that says, respect Sunday. First and second stage, the counsel is very similar. What activities we can be engaged in. And um, and I'll just read two activities and then I'll wrap it up. Um, then we'll 
will be taking in comments and questions. What to do on Sundays during stage one and stage two? She says, hold Sunday schools. That's very, very interesting. On Sunday, they, there is the very best opportunity for those who are missionaries to hold Sunday schools and come to the people in the simplest manner possible, telling them of the love of Jesus for sinners and educating them in the scriptures. So she says, if the Sunday rest law comes and says, don't do anything on Sunday so that you don't disturb people that are going to church, no problem. Obey the law, take your Bible, go next door, or even do Sunday schools. Call some children, teach them about the love of Jesus, and give them Bible studies. That's what she's saying. The next thing she says is, and found in the next slide, is conduct genuine missionary work. Review and Herald, April 6, 1911. After the Sabbath has been secretly observed in places where the opposition is so strong as to arouse persecution if work is done on Sunday, let our brethren make that day an occasion to do genuine missionary work. Let them visit the sick and the poor, ministering to their wants, and they will find favorable opportunities to open the scriptures to individuals and to families. And thus, most profitable work can be done for the master so so this there are many more i, I was just highlighting two general missionary work medical missionary work she's talking about attending to the sick here and also bible work so uh, giving bible studies during this time uh, and this is very important because seven day adventists suffered as you will see in part two of sunday laws seven day adventists were persecuted some of them died uh, during the uh, Sunday law movement of the 18th, 19th, and 20th, early 20th century. Um, so because some of them really believed that if the law says you should not work on Sunday and you obey the law, you are receiving the mark of the beast. And um, that is something that I will clarify. And Ellen White makes it very clear that in this first two stages of the Sunday law, when you comply with the law, you are not receiving the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is only enforced once you, after the law has reached stage three. Uh, so that is very, very important. Uh, because the arguments where some people will say, no, but the fourth commandment says, uh, six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. So on Sunday, you must work. Um, and others were saying, no, but we, we can choose to rest on Tuesday or on Thursday. Uh, it, it's not like you're breaking the fourth commandment. The, the commandment is just saying complete your work on six days. So until Ellen White was um, asked the question, and then she gave responses that are very applicable and very uh, timely, uh, given the times that we're living in. So that is where I will stop for today's presentation. It's been long. And just as an overview, uh, we have seen how the Sunday law is going to come into the United States. Um, we have also seen the Sunday law movement of the 4th century, of the 18th century, a typical uh, bill that we saw. Uh, we are not saying the Sunday law will come out just like that, but we're saying it gives us something to, to work with. And uh, we have seen also uh, a begging from Ellen White that... Uh, uh, suggest that there will be stages and developmental stages to this Sunday law movement. Um, I will now take questions um, or comments that come through. If you want, you can unmute uh, yourself or uh, for for questions or comments. Hey guys, this is Rowell from Florida. How are you, Lago? I'm very well, Rowell. <laughs> good, good. Okay, just want to make sure you can hear me. So I know that you know once the laws begin to become enacted, we're supposed to fight against this, right? I mean, it's like you hear people say, "Oh, I just want the Sunday law to hurry up and come so Jesus can come." I want to do all I can to make sure it hurries up, but at the same time, we're supposed to do our part to to fight against it, just like A.T. Jones, correct? Right, 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 that's correct, that's correct. We need to oppose it with voice and pen and warn the people about the dangers of Sunday laws. So even if we do that, and yet we engage in missionary activity on Sunday, 
um, I mean, we, we can do that without compromising. We're, we can oppose it, but at the same time, engage in missionary work on Sunday. And that doesn't seem at odds. I mean, I, I guess I can understand why people, you know, back in the 1880s thought that they were breaking it. If they, if they complied with it in any way, they felt like they were desecrating the Sabbath, you know, but somehow right, there's a balance right, right. of, somehow there must be a balance of opposing it. And at the same time, you, you're still complying with it. Yes, um, complying with resting on Sunday, but warning the people about its dangers. And, and this, is, this is where the loud cry comes in. I mean, this is why it's called the loud cry. People are going to be asking questions. Uh, why is this happening? And, uh, what is this? And Seventh-day Adventists will be preaching uh, through their literature, and others will be searching. The latter rain will be falling, and the loud cry will be taking place. So people will get to be fully aware of, of this thing. Um, and and uh, even before it gets to stage one, when the Sunday law issue is being agitated like it's, it is now, by certain people who are writing uh, articles in famous newspapers, I'm still looking forward to somebody who's Seventh-day Adventist uh, to write articles and show people the dangers of Sunday laws. And uh, there are few to none that are standing up. And I'm, I'm glad with, with, with your comment that, we, that that's what we need to be doing. Right. OK, good. Thank you. Um, the thing is, the thing is that sometimes we believe that Sunday has to, Sunday laws have to come and then we can go to heaven. But the process of opposing the, the wrongs with Sunday laws, like, um, like Pastor A.T. Jones did, it is so interesting to read his book because he goes through the process. Why? Because he's even saying, it's not about only Seventh-day Adventists or Catholics or Jews. It's to give liberty of conscience to everyone. So the state cannot impose those uh, things because we are, you know, uh, a separation of church and state. But everything is coming to a point where people will be needed or they'll be asking questions because they want to understand. I'm not talking about Adventists. I'm talking about general people. I've been asked, right. why do you keep Sabbath instead of Sunday? And when they ask that to me, it's like, thank you, Lord. Here we go. It's because of this or this and the Bible going through those modes. So I believe that is very important. And another thing, in the days of Ellen G. White, there were some people doing some wood cutting. We are here in a place where we do a lot of wood cutting and preparation for you know colder climates and things like that. And you can do it in only other days of the week. Why do you need to irritate the people that are trying to, you know, keep Sunday so sacred? It's very interesting that we can do Bible work or that type of missionary work and visit homes and help people in our communities. We don't need to irritate unnecessarily right. others. That's not keeping, you know, that's not receiving the mark of the beast. Right, right, right. Thank you for that. Any other question or comment? And, and I, I have actually, while you, you all think on a question or comment, <clears throat> will you cover Luajo at a moment where, where um, stopping from working will become uh, compromising? Like, you know, the three keeper men, if they would have, now down to tie their shoelaces, pretend whatever would have been compromising, or if Daniel maybe closes windows would have been kind of compromising, they on purpose oppose. Will there be a moment, and will you be covering that where where already uh, stopping from doing work becomes a compromise, or? Yeah, I'll cover that in the stage three. A lot coming for next Saturday. Yes, Raluca. Oh, hi. I had a quick question. Um, actually, if, if you could just quickly go over what happened in 1888 at the 50th Congress when Senator Blair proposed the Sunday law. I, j I don't know. I'm not familiar with what, what happened. So he brought this before Congress. And what is the down. history? Did it get voted down or 
What? Or will you also cover it on sun, on it, Saturday? It, it was it, it was never brought to vote. The bill died on the table because it was referred to the Committee on Education and Labor in eighteen eighty eight. So the bill died. Mm -hmm. So and then the next year <coughs> he he reissued another one. It was debated, heavily debated. And that, that book that I sent as a reading assignment, National Sunday Law, does the, the, the actual debate mainly uh, coming from E.T. Jones, uh, engaging Senator Blair. Um, it was never really brought to vote in 1888. Okay. And it, it's insightful to also note that uh, the same year, 1888, there was the 1888 message, the message of righteousness by faith. And Ellen White makes mention that the latter rain had started falling through the message of Christ's righteousness coming upon us. So heaven was preparing, you know, and um, God's providence overruled events. And uh, Ellen White said the people were not ready, the church members were not ready, so God had to overrule events. And in the early 1900s, she finally said we may have to stay here a little bit longer because of insubordination or rebellion. So... Wow. If, if you want to know details around that, I can send you other reading materials. Yes, please. Uh, yeah. Send everything. I one more question. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Ro. Okay. So, you know, I think a lot of confusion, Lago, comes from the fact that, and a lot of this is going to stem from the fact that we believe the U.S. is a Christian country. Um, I think that's another issue that A.T. Jones brought up. Can you address that? Because we're so confused as Americans, even as Seventh-day Adventists, when you have people like Ben Carson putting out a book, One Nation Under God, I mean, can you address the idea that, that America yeah. is not a Christian country? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a confusion that we really need to clarify in our minds, as, as it will be made clear as we study these events that, um, Many Seventh-day Adventists will not know what they are saying in a court of law because, as you saw, you know, they tried to grill A.T. Jones, but he knew his stuff, and he stood his ground and was able to be consistent in his arguments. In other words, what you're saying, Luahu, is we better study our Bibles because if we were taken to a court of law, I would believe that 80% of Adventists, maybe less, would not know how to defend basic Bible doctrines. Right, right. And the core, I think, from that, from what I remember Loajo sharing in Austria, and correct me if I'm wrong, that A.T. Jones really brought in was uh, really showing from Romans 10, is it the separation that this nation was founded separating uh, the religious of uh, conscience, freedom of conscience and of religion and the state not mingling to enforce anything that regarded uh, the first four commandments with our relationship with God, but the state was given power to enforce uh, the last six commandments when somebody was stealing or killing or, or, or that part of the law. And uh, that, that's how this country was founded on what Jesus said, to Caesar what is to Caesar, and to God what is to God, separating the two, right? Yeah, yeah, there's that argument of Christ, uh, separate, uh, render to Caesar the things that belong to Caesar, and to God what belongs to God, and the divine commentary on that, um, on Romans chapter 13, verse 1 to 10. Um, so that was the premise of A.T. Jones's argument, um, that uh, the God has given the government to legislate on matters that have to deal with our relationship between man to man, not on matters of conscience. Uh, when the government legislates on conscience, then you're establishing a theocracy. And uh, a theocracy has to be established by God only, not by earthly governments. And uh, according to Bible prophecy, there should not be any theocracy um, until Christ comes, who will establish a theocracy where he is king. So because Christ said, my kingdom is not of this world. So, but I highly recommend for anyone to read that book, National Sunday Law by A.T. Jones. I send it as a PDF. It's very insightful. It give you, equip you with a lot of arguments to use. Um, and the other books, uh, Sunday Law by A.T. Jones, Rights of the People. And there's also 
other articles written by E.J. Wagner and some of our pioneers, they wrote quite a lot uh, around Sunday law issues um, and that I found very useful in my researches on this issue. Could you do us a favor, Loaho? Could you give us a, a like a suggested um, additional, or how did we call it when we were in college? Well, a, a additional reading material like on, on this topic and then as we go through the classes for those that are interested in going deeper but for this class the, the books you've mentioned from Wagner and and we already I already sent but I can resend if you didn't get I already sent with the reading assignment email the PDF from that Loajo gave me from A.T. Jones's arguments with Senator Blair uh, so it's a long PDF uh, material on, on what he's referring to so what I will do is I will write down the books, but if I do get time, I'm very busy. <laughs> I'll try to give you the PDF books uh, that I found very useful. Awesome. Um, yeah. Awesome. I think there was a hand up, Dad. Well, I wanted to first thank everyone and thank God, but also thank you, Luaho. I know that you're busy. We are all busy, even with the coronavirus. <laughs> But um, I want to make a <laughs> yep, comment for, right. Ra yeah, for Raul, what he was saying in regards of this nation not being, um, not being a Christian nation, it's going to play out like a Christian nation. But the Bible says that they started as a lamb, but it turned out to be a dragon, right? Or a beast, a dragon. And, and we are in that stage of the metamorphosis of that change because everything that we're seeing with lgtb uh with all the different things and spiritualism big time and this nation we know that it's not a nation under god but they're gonna play it like it is and that's what's gonna unite a lot of people this sunday law or this sunday the movement towards sunday because it's like when you don't have a real connection with the lord and all of a sudden there is a something that is being agitated it's like it draws people together but it also gives others that are wanting to know truth that's when they open their minds and it's like what is going on i'm having that happen to me right here people from different places and professional people i'm talking lawyers doctors they're asking questions and we can go to the bible and show them and especially share with them the great controversy for me, I'm buying a boxes from Remnant Publication of Great Controversies again because I've given this book by thousands. But now I'm starting again because it's really the opportunity. Right. And that book, Great Controversy, Ellen White said many people dust it and they'll trace their first convictions to the reading of that book. It will do a lot of the loud cry than we, we think. So especially the last five chapters, I recommend for anyone listening to read through them over and over and study them. It will really strengthen. The last five chapters you said at Loajo? Yeah, the last five chapters of Great Controversy. If awesome. possible, just read through the whole book. But <laughs> yeah. yeah. Any other question before we, we close? I think a lot, a lot will be covered of, of my questions uh, in next, in next uh, study. And uh, thank you, Loajo, very much. Uh, you said it was a long study for me. I don't know for the rest, but when flying by, I was just following so much history and it just uh, fascinating uh, to see what has happened in the past. And also the council that we have so practical uh, to details that I, I believe that if we don't study it, we could make mistakes like you were saying in the 1800s happen of Adventists being persecuted unnecessarily. So uh, really important, important stuff. So if you want to uh, close us up, Loajo, with, with prayer. Yeah, shall we um, thank God for what he has done? And before I pray, I just want you to keep praying for me. Um, that this becomes a success. Um, you see the internet connection challenge. I just believe the enemy is not happy with this class and is trying to bring many things as destruction. So let us pray uh, that the Lord would grant us 
health, especially me health, um, and also bless in the transmission of this information. So it's beneficial to many, many people who hear it. So shall we close our eyes for prayer? <clears throat> Father in heaven, we thank you for the inspired counsel you have given us. May this counsel revive and rekindle in us a spirit and a love for study and help us, O Lord. Many of us have time for Facebook, for WhatsApp, for Twitter, but we don't have time that we spend studying the Bible mm. and making sure that we are ready for a crisis, that we cannot even think about how it's going to play out. It's beyond our wildest imagination. We'll be tested and tried like we have never been before. But we little know of the Bible. We little know of history. We little know of uh, Adventism. Now we ask that you challenge us to wake up out of our dead slumber, to dust our Bibles and to not waste time and to make sure we know and understand them. Bless us today with your presence. Guide us in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.